Another way to manage grief is to really take care of ourselves. It is vital that we feel we are growing and understand that sometimes in life, growing is about pruning. Divorce is actually a form of pruning. Welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And we are going to continue our series on divorce for those of you who are thinking about or in the beginnings of divorce. And we're going to talk today about healing heartstrings, embracing grief in life's new chapter. And honestly, this could be a great episode for a lot of people in the divorce process. In my experience, sometimes people who go through divorce deal with the legal side but not so much the emotional side. And they don't realize that there is grief and loss that needs to be coped with when we're getting divorced. All right, so here we are. And what we think we are is really angry, right? People and a lot of people in the divorce process are really angry, particularly if they're guys and the trigger's been pulled on them. And truthfully, guys, like 70% of all divorces are initiated by women. All right, so it's uh, I don't, you're not alone. But the 30% of women who have had divorce sprung on them, um, they may also experience some anger and some blame. But underneath that is usually another emotion. Anger and blame are a reaction to more vulnerable feelings. And the reason why I singled out guys is men in particular in this country are raised to have, feel empowered. Um, we are, men are not encouraged to feel sadness. Men are not encouraged to grieve, all right? When uh, the going gets tough, the tough get going. Oh, when a person falls off a horse, they get back on it, and that kind of thing. And many women who are competing in a what has been a male-dominated economy find themselves competing in male ways. And what that means is we don't show vulnerability, particularly when we feel like we're under attack. And when do we feel like we're more under attack than when our partner, our loved one, serves us with divorce papers? Or when do we feel more under attack that we feel we need to serve our loved one with divorce papers because they just won't do what's most important and right? And underneath that is they won't do what's right or they served me with divorce is that feeling of hurt. Underneath that is sadness. Underneath that is grieving. And what is it that we're grieving? What could we possibly be grieving? This crappy ass marriage is finally coming to an end. Well, it wasn't always a crappy ass marriage, was it? I mean, at one point, you were in love. At one point, you would have done anything for the other person. At one point, you would have bent over backwards for them. At one point, you, in fact, dedicated all of your time and attention to them, didn't you? And so, of course, there's some sadness and grief at the loss of that dream, even if it was just a dream, even if you recognize now that you were bending over backwards for someone that you thought they were, but they weren't. Even if that's the situation, there's still a sense of grief, still a sense of loss of that feeling, of that time when everything seemed so perfect. That time when you thought you had found the one that you were going to move forward in your life with, that you were going to have kids with, that you were going to build your dreams with. And acknowledging that loss is super important. All right, not acknowledging it with a baseball bat, acknowledging it with vulnerability, acknowledging all the things that were, that were good, even if they were imaginary, that were lost because a part of you was attached to that, a part of you was hooked to that, a part of you wanted that. And so it's vital, you see, that we give ourselves permission to grieve. And when I say grieve... I actually mean mourn, all right? Grief is a feeling that wells up when we have a sense of loss. Mourning is a practice that we do to help us release the grief. 
And we're going to talk about that more in this episode. All right, so we've given ourselves permission to grieve. We've accepted that our emotional reaction is probably normal, even though it's not the normal intensity that of our day. We accept that for the next six months or a year or maybe even two years, this intensity of emotion is probably going to be part of it. Oh, we may compartmentalize it off when we go to work, but it's still going to be there. And what we want is we want to find some ways to cope. And so, duh, one way that we cope is what I just said. We compartmentalize. That means you go to work, I'm at work. I don't need to talk about my divorce. I don't need to talk about what's going on at home. In fact, most people at work will validate that stance. They don't want to know. Most people are afraid they're going to catch it from you, which might lead to more grief, by the way. It's like, why doesn't anybody want to talk to me about this? Why does she have all of our family friends? Or why does he have all of our family friends? And ways that we can manage that and experience it is we can pray and talk to our higher power about it. We can meditate and find our core, our center. We can practice mindfulness. Mindfulness will allow us to be aware of the feeling without it overwhelming us. We can journal if we like to write. We can video journal, kind of like what I'm doing right now is a form of video journaling. There are support groups. We can go talk to other people who are going through what we're going through and let it out and find strategies for healing. We can get therapy. Uh, Maybe we're finding that there are behaviors that we exhibited in this marriage that we don't want to repeat and that have their roots in another part of our life, and we want to untangle the emotional knots, or we can get coaching. We can come to, you can come to someone like me, and we can figure out how to have these feelings while moving forward to a life that is invigorating and joyful for you and your children. Another way to manage grief uh, is to really take care of ourselves. And very often when we're getting divorced and there are children involved, we forget to take care of ourselves because we're showing up for the kids. We forget to take care of ourselves because we need to make money to pay for everything. We forget to take care of ourselves because there's so many things we need to do for our parents, for our friends, for the people around us. We forget. But we're all starting to understand that When the plane's going down, we got to put the oxygen mask on who first? On ourselves first so that we don't pass out and neglect the children. In fact, when we live a life of sacrifice for others, inevitably we're going to run out of steam unless we're practicing self-care. That starts with our body. Our body is the basic instrument. We want to make sure that we're sleeping. That's the big one. Sleep is numero uno. Uh, and sleeping as well as possible. We may need to reduce our screen time before we go to bed. We may need to make sure that we're physically exhausted before we go to bed. We may need to make sure that we're looking at how we've been progressing over the last couple of months instead of how much of a loss we feel from the last couple of years. We may need to be very careful about what we focus on in order to sleep well. We're going to need to exercise regularly and heavily. We're going to need to eat right, all right? We're going to need to take care of our minds, making sure that we're doing everything for our emotions that we need to. We're going to need to take care of our spirit through spiritual practices. We're going to need to make sure that we're connected to other people, all the things that ring our bell. We're going to need to make sure that we're creating and expressing ourselves. And these are all ways to take care of ourselves. And by doing that, we can start to end loneliness and isolation. By connecting with other people and sharing and unburdening, we can lessen our sense of why is this happening to me and start to get that it's happened to many people and many people live through it and we will too. We're going to build ourselves a special support system for this special occasion. The old support system may not work. You're probably going to find that your parents are pretty useless for this with exceptions, there are going to be parents who are really who really do understand divorce. You're probably going to find that many of your friends don't want to talk to you. So you're going to need to find new friends who either are going through divorce or have been divorced. 
so that they can give you some sense of what's coming. You're probably going to need an attorney. You're probably going to need a coach. You may need a therapist. You may need um, a health coach. You Any kind of support that you can bring in, a spiritual advisor, whatever you feel you need, now is the time to bring it in and to create that safety net so that you don't feel alone and so that you have those guidelines and guideposts to navigating forward. In the process of building that network, it is vital that we continue to find meaning in our lives. It is vital that we feel we are growing and understand that sometimes in life, growing is about pruning. Divorce is actually a form of pruning. Pruning out a partnership that isn't working and making room to graft on something new. Meaning is about finding lessons. What are the lessons you need to learn? And before you really move forward, you're going to find that meaning and growth in a mourning process. So the difference between grieving and mourning is that grief is a feeling that we have, a sense of loss. Mourning is a ritual that we put in place that allows us to experience that grief deeply and abundantly so that we can put it away for later. Think about the way we used to bury people, and some people still do. Uh, In Jewish culture, for example, when your partner dies, you spend six days sitting shiva. And in those six days, people bring you food. And in those six days, there's very low expectations about how you're going to look. There's very low expectations about how you're going to dress. Basically, what you are expected to do is to grieve and to talk about endlessly about your sense of loss and talk about your sadness and talk about everything that losing that person meant to you, to your friends and network of support. And people during the Shiva process come in and out. The the family and friends of the person who's sitting Shiva come in and take turns supporting that person and being with them. It's an incredibly meaningful and brilliant process. And then at the end of those six days, the person sitting Shiva, on day seven, they get up and they take a shower and they brush their hair and they clean up their house and they move forward. And that doesn't mean that they don't experience grief anymore. It means that they've emptied the bulk of it out by leaning into their friends and family, by just allowing themselves to focus on this one experience of loss. Now, I'm not saying that in your divorce, you should sit Shiva for six days unless that has meaning for you. I am saying that you want to think about what is a process of mourning that will mimic those qualities for you, where you can put this thing to rest and only bring it out on important days of rest or meditation so that you can function more effectively in the rest of your life. How can you you know, sit Shiva, mourn, so that you can get meaning from this experience? How can you reflect on the grief so that you can take the lessons you need out of it? How can you lean into your friends so they can help you to see what you did do that right instead of thinking that maybe you did everything wrong? Or how can you lean into your friends to help you take responsibility for the places where you did drop the ball so that you can learn and grow from it? You want that kind of mourning experience. And you might literally want to bury the marriage in effigy or burn it or whatever it is you need to do to release it. Maybe the mar- you have a, a dove that you release into the wild, whatever it is that works for you. Google it, research it, call me. We'll figure out how to do this together. And once you've got this sense of meaning and growth, now you're ready to move forward. Now you're ready to create a new vision for your life. One, if you have children, one in which the other parent is a new kind of partner, a parenting partner, only a business partner, perhaps. One where you have a set of values, you hopefully, and a way of raising the children that you can share in together. Not one that you impose on them or that they impose on you, one that you generate together. I've worked with a lot of couples as a parent coordinator, a lot of divorce couples, 
couples is the wrong word, a lot of divorced parents as a parent coordinator, helping them to create, shape, build, envision what, what the core values, principles, and boundaries are going to be for their children in, in the two households so that they show a unified face to the children. That's what moving forward is about here. It's about having a sense of where you're going, what's best for you, and what's best for you with your children. This is where the opportunity comes for new beginnings. This is where all the openings for your new future, for your new self even, are going to emerge. As always, I'm here if you have any questions. As always, uh, I want to hear about your takeaways. As always, I want to know what's going on with you. Reach out to me, text me, direct message me, contact me at rich at richinrelationship.com. Subscribe, share this episode with your friends if you feel like it's got meaning for you. And we're going to be doing, this is episode two, another 12 episodes on this in the coming weeks since there's so much and so much uh, like depth and importance to this. In the meantime, thank you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.